All right, here we go. Welcome, everyone. My name is Trapper Goldsmith, host of the T Rap Show, where we showcase elite athletes and sport individuals with their inspiring stories and rise to glory in their pursuit of everlasting greatness. Today, we have a very special guest with us, a true legend of the game of football. He was born and raised in the heart of Boston and went on to become a star player at the Northeastern University. From there, he went on to play for two of the most iconic teams in the NFL, the New England Patriots and the Dallas Cowboys. Our guest has had an eminent career in football, but it's just it's not just his on-field success that makes him a standout. He's also known for his work ethic, dedication, and passion for the game. I mean, this guy, he crushes workouts at 10 p.m. at night, then goes on to play City League football at 11 p.m. Oh, yeah, and he's got four kids and a beautiful wife who all look up to him as their hero. He finished his football career up in the CFL and actually signed a one-day contract so that he would be retired as a Winnipeg Blue Bomber, where he currently resides with his family. So today, he joins us to share his incredible journey from growing up in Boston to becoming a professional football player, what it was like playing with seven-time Super Bowl champ Tom Brady, and everything in between. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest, the true icon of the game, Jason, don't call him slow, Vega. Jason, welcome, man. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. So I know you're like an all-around stud of an athlete. Was it always football? Like, is that what you did in Boston growing up? Or was it like you had to defend your lunch money growing up in Boston and then the football coach just kind of noticed you? How did it all start? Uh, I would say football was kind of always my love um, in terms of what I wanted to play. Um, I remember playing the John Maddens back in 93 and 94. Uh, I think <laughs> my brother would play him and I didn't really know how to play, but I know he really enjoyed it. So I played with him a little bit and then I started picking up watching it live and um, playing it in my backyard, whether it was with him or by myself. Um, and then it just kind of grew from there. So you didn't actually play any other sports like football was life. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I, I did a little bit of baseball, a little bit of basketball, um, but football was definitely the one for me. And and were you always a big kid? Like, because you're you're a big dude. Um, I don't think so. Um, I think I might have been tall for my age. I think the only thing I can remember is in the second grade, I was about four feet tall. So I don't know if that's big nowadays, but um, <laughs> I do remember that. And then uh other than that, I was always really, really scrawny until I got to about 19. And then I kind of grew up from there. <laughs> then started eating steak and potatoes and, and filling out. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so playing through high school, you, you when did you start to see the picture that, hey, this could go further than than just kind of playing the game? Um. I think it was something where, you know, where I was from, we always tried to have that conversation about you know, what was possible. Um, and you know, uh, where I grew up, there wasn't a lot of, um, prosperity. There's a lot of poverty there. It wasn't a, a really affluent place. So, um, for us, football and sports was our ticket out. Mm. Um, and then when you, when you're looking for your ticket out, you're, you're looking at the highest of all high. Right. So yeah. I looked at the NFL as a possibility. And I remember as a freshman, I was telling guys, Oh, I'm going to go to Florida state. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. And you know, not really realizing how difficult that would actually be to go to those places where I was from. So, um, yeah, it was something where we always kind of talked about it. And fortunately for me, it worked out. So what, what made it difficult to, to really hit some of those top States and, and div one schools? Is it just like, there's so many guys trying to get in. Is it, you didn't really know the level of, of football at that time that it would take? Um, I think it, a lot of it had to do with the recruiting and, and understanding how that worked. Um, you know, they always say that no matter how, no matter where you are, they'll find you as long as you're good enough. That's not a hundred percent true just because they won't look in places that they don't think they have to. Um, and my city in particular had a bit of a bad rep for some players that had left uh, and gone to university. So I know that, uh, played a part in some of the uh, school's interests um, in me personally. And then, you know, my parents didn't know a lick about football or why I was doing it or anything. Right. So they didn't even understand recruiting. So I could tell you 
Like I remember I had shoe boxes full of mail from schools telling me to go to their camps and stuff. And, you know, we didn't have the money for me to do that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had no opportunity to, to go fly to Illinois or go to Florida so I can go to a camp. And I didn't understand what that really was. It's like, well, why, why do they want me to go to a camp? I'm, I'm playing football up here. Right. Right. So um, I think a lot of it had to do with just not understanding how the game of recruiting went. Um, and that was really the beginning of how recruiting went digital and you had to put up videos online and huddle and all these other things where um, it became more of selling yourself rather than just being a good football player. Yeah. Yeah. I had uh, I had Warren Ward on the podcast as well, and he actually said the same thing. Like the, the saying where if you're good enough, you'll get noticed isn't isn't always true. You still got to have the opportunity and you got to get in front of the right eyes. Yep. to to really see that so then you went to northeastern was that what when did that kind of solidify that was my senior year um two of my high school teammates had gone to or had committed to go to northeastern uh and it was 20 minutes from my house um and my mom was was struggling with her health around that time so um for me it was a bit of an easy decision for me to say you know what like I'd rather stay close to home. It's what I know. Some guys that I played with are going there, and then I can be close to home too. So it it was a win for me. It was a good education. Okay, so you you went through university, but then you went up north to the CFL up here in in God's country, Canada, mm-hmm. uh, and signed with the Blue Bombers. So how did that opportunity come about when? You were kind of focused on staying around for home and then you really, uh, really flew the coop and and came up north. Um, So there's a a big portion uh, that happened before that, um, that a lot of people don't know. Um, So my senior year after the last game, the day after the last game, uh, the football program folded. So they announced it to everyone. They said, uh, you guys are all going to have to find new universities um, because we will no longer play. Um, and that came out of nowhere. So, um, you know, for me, I was a senior, didn't matter to me, at least I didn't think so. Um, but all the other guys were obviously panicking because they're trying to figure out how they can transfer and where they can transfer to. And then it becomes like an open recruiting for them. Right. Um, but like I said, unbeknownst to me, it was going to make my journey more difficult too, because those phone calls to the university to get information or film or whatever, wouldn't go unpicked up because there's oh, no, no doubt. Um, so they wouldn't have anyone to contact at the school to get film. They could come see me, but they couldn't schedule it because they couldn't call me directly. Um, so that part of it was complicated. Uh, I went undrafted, even though I performed really well um, at the camps that I went to, because uh, I went to the BC Pro Day, the Harvard Pro Day, and the UMass Pro Day, and then tested out top 10 in my position and nothing happened from there. Um, so then I actually ended up going up to Hamilton um, as a free agent or rookie camp, whatever it was. Um, Cause my, after the draft, my agent said, okay, well, you know, we can wait. Um, you could go to actually, as I'm, as I'm talking, I remember he told me I can go to Baltimore Um for their rookie camp or whatever it was that was going on at the time. Uh, but it was the same weekend as my graduation for university. Mm. I said, no, I, I have to graduate. I, I can't go down there. Looking back on it, I probably would have preferred to go. Um, but at that time, like I said, uh, graduating in the education side of things was more important. Uh, and I thought, you know, that stuff will take care of itself if that's what's going to happen. Um, so like I said, graduated. Uh, and then my agent said, well, you know, have you heard of Canada? I'm like, of course I've heard of Canada. He goes, well, they have a football <laughs> league. I'm like, what? Like they have a, they have a football league? He goes, well, yeah, it's called the CFL. I'm like, okay. Uh, and then he says, well, this team in Hamilton. And so that's that's legit, eh? Like you, I know you've got a sense of humor, yeah. but like for sure you didn't even know we had a league up here. No, I, I didn't even know they had a football league in Canada. Oh, that's so funny. Um, and then he goes to tell me that it's Hamilton. I said, where the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at that time, there's 
iPhones were uh, really, I think that was like the iPhone one or two, whatever it was. So, you know, you pull up maps and like, oh my gosh, like, okay, fine, whatever. That's it's football, football's football. Yeah. Uh, and I go up there and that was, um, that was an experience I'll never forget because there's so much about the Canadian game that I'd never seen before or even heard of um, that made that transition a little bit more uh, difficult for me initially, but then, you know, obviously football's football, you figure it out. and you're right. Yeah. So 2000, that was 2011. Hey, you were playing. That would have been 2010 is when I graduated. So I went up to Hamilton at, t- at that time. Um, I'd made the team. And then um, oh, I forgot what it's called. Uh, oh, I fractured my pubic synthesis uh, in camp. Um, but then I continued to play. And then I got to the point by, I think it was like week three or so of the season where I really couldn't walk um, at all after practice. So I ended up getting released um, as a result and then went back home to Northeastern um, and became a student advisor there um for the athlete services to schedule classes and you know all that stuff to keep them up to um, their academic standards um did that for i think it was about six months um and then i got a call from my agent he said hey you know if you're interested there's um there's a possibility that you could work out for green bay now there was a conversation with Green Bay uh, kind of going back and forth for a while because uh, he knew one of the front office guys there. Um, but then that year, I believe, is where they were having some kind of walkout issue um, where the players weren't reporting to camp and what have you. So it was a little bit messy in terms of when camp could possibly start, if it was going to start and yeah. not. So he said, well, there's also this Winnipeg team that's having a workout in Houston. Okay. <laughs> so he says, you know, like you can go out to Houston and, and see how it goes. And um, I took a day off from work. Uh, I flew to Houston and uh, I'd never been to Houston before. I really traveled outside of Northeast uh, at all. Um, so flew out to Houston, get off the plane. I think I caught a taxi to some field and there it was like these guys were working out. And uh, I got there about a half hour late because I went to the wrong field. <laughs> and uh yeah i did my thing um worked out and then by the time i got back on the plane they had offered me a contract to go play so nice. i i signed um and did that and i think the most satisfying part of that whole um equation or the the, the series of events is i got back to work and i mentioned to my boss who was my athletic um <clears throat> advisor i said hey uh i think i'm gonna go take an opportunity to go play football because, you know, I've really wanted to, I didn't really get the shot that I thought I deserved. Um, And I think I'm going to take another shot and I'll never forget her words were, uh, why would you want to waste your time? And uh, you know, at that point I said, that's exactly what I wanted you to say. Thanks for nothing. Uh, And I packed up my stuff. I told my kids I was leaving in two weeks and obviously I got the support that I wanted from everyone else. Um, but I don't think I spoke another word to her from that day on, um, up to this day where I, I, like I said, I don't know where she is, what she's doing, but I haven't said a word to her. Well, hopefully she's watching the podcast and she's seen, (laughs) you know, where, where you went from there. Yeah. But so that's, she was more saying as an insult to you that you didn't have the potential to play pro football or just that playing pro football is a waste. Uh, I I think it was a little bit of both um, in Mm -hmm. the sense that, you know, for her, I think selfishly, she was saying that she wanted me to just stay there and, you know, forget about the football thing because I already had tried and it didn't work. Yeah. Um, And then, you know, I I don't know if there was more to it than that, but, um, you know, I felt like I hadn't given it the the fair shake that I thought I should have. Um, And, you know, it took some time for me to kind of get back into shape because what I would do is I'd go uh, to work at the university. I get there at like five o'clock in the morning. I go to the open field. I'd run, work out, do my thing, show up to work at seven, uh, you know, and, you know, just carry about my day, go home, work out at home at the end of the day. So I was putting my best foot forward to try to make sure I was ready for anything that came up. And he said, fortunately it did. And it worked out. It's funny how so many good athletes have had a catalyst like that. Hey, that, that just kind of, I mean, even, 
uh brady didn't get drafted he got drafted you know way way down there uh i remember as a junior golfer and at this point i'm like okay you know i i think i'm gonna pursue golf my head pro my coach at that time from our our whole our hometown golf course he was like trapper i remember we're on the range i can still remember it today he's like i don't think golf is for you He's like, I think you should pursue other endeavors and, and, you know, get your business degree and, and go that route. Yeah. And I was like, damn, like, you know, I was, I don't know what I was 16 or 17 at, at that time, but, uh, that I, that was a catalyst for me. It, it was like, no, I, you know, you may, I I'll fully admit at that time, I wasn't that good. Like my skill was nowhere, but he, you can't, you can't determine a, a person's desire and willpower. For sure. When it comes to that. Okay. So 2000, that was 2011, which was kind of your official rookie year in the CFL. You had 26 tackles, seven sacks. You had a really good kind of rookie year with, with the blue bombers. Um, What were your goals that year? Like entering that, that CFL year, was it like, you know, I'm going to come up to Canada, I'm going to kick ass and then hopefully some bigger teams notice me or yeah. Um, going into it, I, I was familiar with a couple of players that had played in the CFL and then made it back to the NFL. Um, Philip Hines, um, gosh, there was a D end. Um, Cameron Wake was obviously the most popular one. Um, played for BC for a while and then he went to go play for the Dolphins for a long time. Um, so like those kinds of things were all in my head uh, in terms of what was possible. And I said, OK, well, I'm going to go up here. I'm going to grow as a player, um, learn the things that I never knew, uh, and then to see what happens and hopefully I perform. Um, and we went out for our first game. I started, or I made the the team, obviously. I started the first game, which was big for me. Um, and at, I think it was the second quarter or third quarter, it might have been, um, I tore my MCL uh, on a sack. Crazy. Um and I didn't really know what that was, uh, like the MCL side of things. So then I tried to run. I'm like, what's wrong with my leg? Like, it's not, <laughs> there's something wrong. Leg's not coming with me. Yeah. So I go over there and they're like, yeah, you just, you just tore your MCL. Okay. Well, um, so what do I do? Like come back next week or, you know, how's that work? And they're like, no, like you, you're going to have to go on a cat, like a brace and you have to rehab and all that stuff. And I think that was really the first time I had really been hurt. Um, mm-hmm. in my career where I had to sat out or sit out. And um, again, this is one of those situations where, you know, my D line coach who um, I don't think a lot of people would have done well under him just because of his style. He was very much in your face, uh, pushed your buttons every opportunity he could, but he was trying to get the most out of you all the time. Um, and he let me know that from day one, the minute I walked on there, he was chastising me and I'm like, man, what's this guy's problem? <laughs> you want me to be here like I could just go home like what's what's the deal but um he may be a better player um and the reason why I have that that part of it is I think it got to like week seven or so I think it was about six weeks that I had been rehabbing and um I was eligible to come back and going into that game uh the weeks prior to the guy that was behind me had been playing well so he uh said to me he said listen um I don't really know how to tell you this, but you don't really have a spot when you come back because, you know, the other guy's been playing well and, you know, we had to bring that some other guys up. So he said, you're going to have to play defensive tackle a little bit. Um, otherwise you won't fit here. So I just, I've never played defensive tackle in my life. And <laughs> um, I said, this ought to be really interesting. And you know, I'd never uh, been playing with a brace or all those things. So there's lots uh, to look at in that game that would have made things a bit difficult. And I, I went out and performed. I played well that game in my first game back. Um, and then that kind of grew into a bigger thing for me where they saw me as someone who could play multiple positions, not just one. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, and that was kind of where I left my mark in or on that team for that year. Um, and I saw some success in that second half of the year, because I was able to play multiple positions and and kind of do that. So, And so your rookie year, you guys actually went to the great cup against the BC lions. You, you ended up losing a close one, but how, 
like how satisfying was it your rookie year you get to play for um you know the the championship in in the final you came back from injury what was that feeling like um i think it was surreal but misleading at the same time because it made it feel like it was easy right um because not to say that i didn't struggle through some things but I didn't feel like it was something I couldn't accomplish. Right. So, you know, I come back and I'm like, Oh, wow, I'm playing well, you know, we're playing well, like things, things are great. And, you know, the thing about pro sports is the parody of it where, you know, one day you're great or one, one year, your team's great. The next year, your team's terrible Um, (laughs) because the other teams got better. And that's kind of what happened for us is, you know, we played really well that first year. Um, and in the in the Grey Cup, my best friend actually had gotten hurt, who played D T tackle. Right, I think it was like the first quarter or first drive. I don't even remember. He got poked in the eye, so he couldn't play. So then I moved down and you know played out of position really the whole entire game. Um, we lost, and then I was like, oh, you know what, no big deal. Like we'll just come back next year. You know, it's not it's nothing. And then, like I said, I think we won four games the next year. We were yeah. absolutely terrible. Um, and that put things into perspective for me where it's just like, oh, well, you know, just because things go well one year doesn't mean they will the next year. And, um, you know, it it just made us more, I guess, focused on the idea that you have to take advantage of the things in front of you when you have it. So hundred percent life of sport and life of an athlete. Hey, Mm -hmm. all right. So you did end up getting your shot to head back down to the NFL with the new England Patriots. How did that deal come about? Um, I keep talking about myself getting hurt. Uh, <laughs> so welcome the, to football. Hey, no kidding. At the end of uh, 2012, um, I had some kind of foot issue. I can't remember what it was. So I didn't play the last game, if I remember correctly. And uh, I went home. I think it was the middle of November, the end of November. I can't remember. It was somewhere around that time. So it was right around Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving. Um, so yeah, I just kind of had been working out for a couple of days and, um, my agent called me and says, Hey, um, new England wants you to go work out. And there was a period of time where you had to wait until you could work out. I don't remember what that timeline is or if it's changed now, but after the regular season, you had to wait X amount of days. So I want to say it was the day after Christmas that they wanted me to work out. So, um, yeah, it was just like, okay, well, I guess I'll put some cleats on. Uh, for the first time in a while, just because I hadn't been able to run and figure this out. So there's a, I guess, two or three weeks where I'd been kind of trying to run and, and do everything on the field at Brockton High, which is where I'm from, um, in the snow. And I remember, I can't find those damn pictures, but I had pictures <laughs> like I was taking, like, this is Christmas Eve and I'm running out in the snow and this is Christmas and I'm here running in the snow. And, you know, it was, it was pretty cool because I'm like, I'm, I'm getting ready for something and I don't know what's going to happen, but at least I have the opportunity to go. Um, so yeah, I go, uh, that morning and, and work out with, I think it was like nine or 10 other guys. Um, and the same kind of situation happened by the time I got home, um, there was a contract offer and, you know, I'm a new England guy. I said, well, what other situation would I want to be in? I'm close to yeah. home. And, um, you know, I get to play for the home team and under Belichick. So this is, this is what I want to do. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so you, you told me, you've told me this story before Tom Brady, uh, you're, you're coming to this you know, the, the field, the stadium, and he comes up to you, introduces himself and, uh, Hey, Jason, I'm, I'm Tom. And you're like, yeah, kind of, I kind of know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it was one of those things. I think it was after one of our workouts or something, um, he was in the locker room. Uh, I had just come in, um, and you know, like I'm obviously very familiar with everyone on the team being from Massachusetts and everything. So, um, you know, you try not to be starstruck, you know, because yeah. you're on the same team. You can't do things like that. Uh, but I obviously I'm like, well, man, this is Tom Brady. And this is a big deal. And uh, I was like, well, you know, just play it cool. Just go into the locker room and, you know, somewhere <laughs> along the lines, you know, you could say hi to him or something. Yeah. And um, yeah, he came up to me and he was like, hey, man, I'm, I'm Tom. I'm like, I, I know who you are. Um, <laughs> I'm Jason, you know, just just in case yeah. you didn't do that. Um, and yeah, he, he was just a normal guy, you know, having conversation with me. And uh, I remember he was listening to one of Jay-Z's albums that had just come out at the time. So I was like, Oh man, Tom Brady, you know, this is Jay-Z, like my kind of guy. 
Yeah. We're going to be friends. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be cool. And um, yeah, like I said, it was, uh, it was a short interaction, at least that first uh, initial thing, but you know, he was always cool enough in the sense that, you know, if he saw you, he wouldn't just walk by you because he didn't really know you. He'd say hi to you and just kind of stop and say, how you doing kind of thing. So um, definitely a positive experience uh, when it comes to meeting someone of that caliber and who he was. So I like you and you and I, again, have touched base, but I'll let you fill our listeners in. The difference between the Patriots and the Cowboys, you got to play for both organizations, but obviously one um, Brady was was with. What were the big differences, how Brady um, ran the team and the, and the coaching staff at Patriots versus over in Dallas? I found um, Dallas to be certainly more – player friendly uh it was very loose um you know they would play games in the locker room and and you know the it was definitely a lighter feeling uh Mm -hmm. whereas new england was was very much business like right you're there to watch film or work out um it's not to say that guys didn't have fun but it just wasn't you could feel that the atmosphere was different right it was almost like you're at the office and and you're there to get your work done and 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 be gone right so um, I always joke about the, the, my first interaction or one of my first interactions with coach Belichick was, you know, he's standing next to me in, in the launch line. I'm like, Holy smokes, it's, it's Bill Belichick. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, he's just like, morning, morning. That was it. Like, the only interaction. To it. Yeah. And you know, you can't really follow up with a conversation with someone that just kind of wants to give you a high and buy. Right. So it was like, okay. That's that's what we're going to do here. That's how we do things. So um, it was very much different from, you know, the the other place that I'd gone where, you know, coaches would stop and chat and even right. Jerry Jones was there and his son was there and you could talk to whoever. It was very much the opposite. So there's no denying the, you know, Brady's success and the Patriots' success. And do you think in your mind that's a better approach or – you can win with with any culture if if you have a the winning team i think you you can win with any culture as long as you have the right pieces in place um right. if you have you know I, I think it has to be a situation where your your situations have to complement each other uh if you don't have a great coach you better have great players that are leaders if you have a great coach um then he can overcome some of the lack of leadership you have in a locker room um, but I think what made the Patriots most successful is that they had both. They had players who were leaders um, and a coach who had a, a real tight grip on things that could mm. lead the way, uh, show them how to be professional and what they're there for. Um, but every now and again, show some humility where, you know, you'd see he was joking around or what have you, but it was, it was strictly business all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And you and I have actually kind of talked about this offline. I believe. Either can win, but you got to stay consistent with your team culture. So if you have the, you know, we're straight business, we're, this is how we operate, but then half of your staff or half of the team is, is like happy, go lucky, chill. You, you create a lot of conflict within the team. So as long as you stay consistent with your message, your coaching, your players, I think either uh, can be successful. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about the difference between that that league up in Canada versus playing in the NFL. What's the caliber of of play? The biggest difference you you saw going from both leagues? I think it has mostly to do with the consistency of that high caliber player, right? In the NFL, you're looking at the best of the best typically. Um you know, the best 55 players on every team uh, all the time. And sure, you'll see some some guys that maybe they don't really fit uh, that aren't top tier guys, but you know who's lining up on the field mm. is top tier. Um, whereas in the CFL, it's not to say that there isn't that level of competition or, or athleticism or anything like that. It's just you see it more consistently on the NFL. So the CFL is made up of guys who want to make it back to the NFL, who probably are capable of playing in the NFL, but for one reason or another or not, whether they had an injury history, um, you know, too short, too slow, whatever it is, uh, or just didn't get the opportunity. Um, I think when you're looking at it holistically, you'd have to say that on a 
consistent level from position by position, you would see obviously higher quality talent across the board in the NFL um, as opposed to the CFL. So looking back now, you've you've been retired for a bit. What would you have needed to do at that time to stay in the NFL longer? Um, I think hmm. I think my approach to the game would have been different. I, I, mm-hmm. I don't think I ever really put it into perspective that it was something that could end. Um and that I didn't have to put 125% all the time and make sure that I'm dedicating all of my time to being a better player. Um, I'm not suggesting that I didn't do anything. It's just, I felt like I just could have done more. Right. And yeah. I think that's what separates your top tier hall of famers and, and, you know, physical attributes that they're born with aside. Um, you know, when you're a fringe player, that's trying to stick on a team, to a guy that stays on a team for a long time, I think the difference is just doing the little bit more, the little bit extra here and there that you don't think you have to mm. uh, was probably the biggest difference for me. So, um, yeah, if if I could point something out, it'd probably be that. Um, but I'm certainly not disappointed with what I was able to accomplish coming from where I was. Yeah, you have to be grateful for for what you achieved, but that's such a that's so powerful what you, what you said there because I think uh, all of us, not even just athletes, always think like we take time for granted, one hundred percent. It's like, well, I have my five year goal. Well, what if you didn't have five years? You know, oh, I want to win the Super Bowl or the Great Cup. You know, in in twenty twenty seven. Well, what if what if you didn't have till twenty twenty seven? How hard would you try if all you had was was this year and then it snatched from us? And and I was totally guilty of that as well in in my career. I thought that's why I chose golf, not football. Uh, one because I'm a little skinny, uh, but two because the longevity of it. Like I just wanted to play golf forever, and so I always took that for t- granted. It's like ah, oh, you know, maybe maybe in my thirties I'll start to you know really really take off. So yeah. Okay, came back to the CFL. We retired as a bomber. How hard how hard was it to say, okay, you know, it's it's time. It's a career. Um, I don't think it was difficult for me just because I don't know who said it, but um I've always kind of carried the idea that once football started to feel like a job that I wouldn't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um and, you know, I'd always kind of had a mind for the idea that it would potentially end. Um, and I wanted to be someone who had some preparation in place for the idea that you wouldn't play. Um, not necessarily had a job lined up or anything like that. It was just, you know, if and when the game stopped, I would be okay mentally saying, yeah, okay, fine. I'm not playing anymore. Um So, you know, the biggest point for me, I think, would have been my last year when I was in Edmonton is when I had my son uh, in the middle of this, or my wife had my son, I should say. Um, (laughs) Well, you did contribute. (laughs) Yeah, I did contribute. Um, You know, my son was born about midway through the season or I think three quarters of the way through. And, um, you know, I had to fly back, obviously, because she stayed home in Winnipeg. And I thought to myself, this is not where I want to be right now. I'd rather. Mm. Um, And it's not to say that there's anything wrong with the the guys who travel away from their families. It just wasn't for me. So um, I remember my last or the last regular season game that year, I went to my coach in the, in the morning. I said, Hey man, I'm, I'm done. Like, don't call me. I'm not coming back. Like I'm done. So um, yeah, that was really it. And I said, I was happy with that decision to just walk away when I was ready to. All right. Good for you. Uh, so the, the one day contract with, with the bombers talk about that like was that your idea was that the organization kind of talking to you about that um i think it was a combination of the two uh there was a guy that worked for the team darren cameron he was the media relations something 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 he's got like a million titles but um you know i had some conversation with him because i knew that winnipeg was going to be where i was going to stay um And I wanted to kind of make it official that I was done um, so that I wouldn't try to go back or no one would call me. Like, I'm just not interested in playing. And, you know, I just want to close that chapter <clears throat> officially in my life and just kind of move on. So I said, it only makes sense. I live in Winnipeg. That's where I'm going to stay. And uh, I might as well make it happen since that's where I played the longest too. Nice. And all right, man. Like, I know you have an amazing family, incredible supportive wife. 
you had you had one kid while playing football. Now you have four. Did you always know you wanted a big family? I think so. Um, I came from, a, I guess, a family of five. So my brother and sister, which are both older than me. Um, I certainly never anticipated um, being in a position where I only had one um or two it was always kind of like three or more and uh, my wife's family was kind of the same way where she had three or more uh in her particular case it was three but you know her mom had several sisters and brothers and etc so um you know for me i think it was definitely something where we wanted to make sure that our kids were plentiful and they had each other to play with all the time and we have it's still out for discrepancy how you and Brittany actually met uh, both sides have, have different stories to tell, but I came across this gem, uh, and, and we're going to share it here today. This is, I think this sums up Jason here. Look at, look at how confident he is here. He's like, man, I'm about to roll on this girl. She don't even know what's going to happen. Look at look, dead serious pulling up the fruit roll brick can't even take it she's like i'm done i'm done the head nod eye closed right there i when i seen this man yeah. my level of competition is quite high even with her she complains all the time even with your wife oh man that was that was a gem i was laughing my butt off when when i seen that so did you get the whole thing like you oh, didn't sure. stop telling, yeah. Didn't yeah, stop. No, no, I, I had to finish it because then she would say that we didn't finish. I said, no. <laughs> so I know you have an incredible wife with Brittany. Did did she always support football? Like, did she travel with you when you were playing? Uh, no, she was in university. Um, so she stayed home um, 90% of the time in Winnipeg. And uh, she'd come out to, to see me play wherever she could. Um, she traveled with uh, my father-in-law, but most of the time she would have to stay in Winnipeg. Um, but she's probably the biggest reason why I came back to the CFL um, <clears throat> because she was here in Winnipeg. Because um, after I had finished in Dallas, uh, I thought about going back and, you know, trying out with a different team and kind of continuing that path just to kind of make sure I was done right before I left. And like I said, it was just kind of one of those things where she was back in Winnipeg. I said, you know, let me just continue or finish what I was started and um, <clears throat> back to the CFL. And my last two years in Toronto and Edmonton were really her kind of pushing me along, say, hey, like, if you want to play, go play. Like, don't worry mm -hmm. about me. I'll be fine. Um, so she definitely was more of a support system in that respect than anything else. You got to got to go where the heart is, right? And did she understand how dangerous the game is? Like, did that ever scare her or she just kind of blocked that part out and was super supportive? Um, well, I guess with my, like especially, injury. especially when you had your son, right? Yeah. I, I think when it came to, um, when she was part of my career, uh, my rookie year, she kind of had it, you know, um, you know, first person view of how things are and how rough they can be. Yeah. Um, you know, cause you come back after every game and you're okay for a little bit, but then the next morning you're, you're training, <laughs> and, um, you know, you've got two days to figure it out and then you're back onto the practice field. So, um, I think she was always fully aware of those things. I don't know how she'll take it when it comes to our kids playing. Um, mm. she's kind of been vocal in that respect when she's like, you know, my kids are not playing, you know, they're not going to box. They're not going to do this. They're not going to do that. Um, but I, I do think that uh, there are times where, you know, that movie Concussion came out um, by Will Smith. And yeah. that was incredible movie. <laughs> yeah, it was a great movie. And I think it was a bit of an eye opener for everyone, including myself, in terms mm -hmm. of like, what CTE was and yeah. um, <clears throat> I guess how complicated it could be. Um, but, you know, as a as a player, you know, those kinds of things are possible. And, you know, I'd had concussions, so. It wasn't like I was unfamiliar with the concept. It was just, um, you know, you had to try to play it smart whenever possible. So, And you, Jace, you transferred into a sales career that you were kind of grooming towards the end of the end of your football career. I know uh, during the off seasons and stuff. Did you find that sales fed that competitive side of you? 
I think so. Yeah. Only because um, <clears throat> it was different because it was, I mean, car sales are, is different because it, it is team sales, but really, you know, you're out there for yourself in a way, just trying to make sure that you do as best you can for you and your family. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think that part of it became a competitive, um, motivator for me. And then, you know, for those guys who did know who I was or what my background was, they, you know, took that as an opportunity to try to be competitive with me too. Cause it's like, well, you might be good at football, but I'll be a better car sale. Right? <laughs> I would um, wipe the floor with you <laughs> on the sales floor. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was all in good fun and I, I made sure that, uh, I won my fair share of battles and yeah, it was good. What'd you miss most about the game? Oof. Uh, I would say it's probably just the atmosphere of a game, you know, like just going out there and, and in particular, Winnipeg's crowd is pretty um, <clears throat> jubilant and active and, and I would say definitively one of the better crowds in the CFL. So um, it's they got to keep moving to stay warm while they're <laughs> watching you guys. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh yeah you should ask Brittany about 2011 that he's final but um yeah it was it was definitely that part of things where you know coming out to the fans and and hearing the noise from the field mm -hmm. level and just kind of it's how it changes based off of how things are going I think is probably what I miss the most so what do you find some similarities between sales and sport um I think it's just dealing with adversity Mm -hmm. Um, and just not having, you know, sunshine and rainbows all the time, it's not going to be that way. And I think that, you know, what I'd said in that first year for me, where, you know, we made it to the great cup and then nothing, like we're terrible the next year is kind of like that idea in car sales in particular, where, you know, you might have a great month, but then the next month you start at zero again. Um, so where do you go from there? And, and you have to kind of build on your brand and, and continue to do what you do and try to figure out different ways to, to sell. So nice. And I may have some inside info uh, that I know you're you're going through some finance uh, exams and and working on getting your license in a different industry. But what's in sport we take for granted as athletes? I think just having goals, like my, my goals to improve here, my goals to achieve this. What's some big goals you have now post sport that you're working towards? Um. I think it's it's making sure first and foremost is making sure that my kids uh, have a childhood that far surpasses anything that I would have ever done. Mm -hmm. um, what's most important to me is, you know, setting the bar for my kids and then raising the bar and then they raise the bar for their kids. And, you know, they'll have something to talk about from generations to come about who their grandpa was or who their dad was or what have you. Right. Um, and what they've done in comparison. So, I think that would be probably number one. Um, and then just having the the financial flexibility of just kind of doing what we want when we want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't something I grew up with. Uh, it was most of the time it was pretty tough. Um, just kind of going about things and, you know, hey, do we have this? Do we have enough money for that? Um, and I don't, I don't think those are things that I ever want to concern myself or my kids with uh, at any point. So moving towards that direction, whether it is in fact car sales or anything else that I desire to do um, is going to be moving in that direction. Good for you, man. Yeah. You're such a, one of the things I, I highly respect about you is you're, you're such a family man. I know how much you, you care for your family and your kids and being a role model for them. What do you tell your kid when he says, dad, I want to play pro football, just like you. Um, we already we already know what Brittany's gonna say, but what does what does dad say? Uh I think um I think my conversation is essentially that you know I'll be as good a support system as he could need. Um I'll be a better support system than the one that I received. And you know, he'll have he'll definitively have to give his best shot in order to get his best shot. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll be there to to support them um, more so with my knowledge and my experience of what I went through. Um, and I think that's always been a really important part of any um, career like that is having experience on your side of what to do, what not to do and, and how to go about, you know, elevating yourself to the next level. And I think I'd be able to help. How do you coach your kids through adversity? Because, and I've always talked about this as, as a dad, 
like I've to- always been very transparent with my kids. You have what it takes to go professional, hundred percent, and, and you have a. Uh, I would support you one hundred percent, but it's a totally different commitment level. Like it's it's a totally different hitting adversity level that you're going to go through to to actually attain that, and mm-hmm. and it's not something I would push ever ever on my kids. Um, mm-hmm. I told them I would support them if they play for fun or or they want that. So how do you coach your kid knowing the adversity he's going to have to go through to play at a professional level? Um, you know, I don't know that I have the answer for that. Um, mm-hmm. I know, you know, there are things that I try to do now, which is, you know, the simple things like not yeah. letting the kid win. Like I'm going to make him work for it. Right. Especially um, when we're doing fruit roll-ups. Yeah. Like <laughs> whatever it is, if it's fruit roll-up, it's, it's, it's soccer in the basement. If it's, you know, video games, whatever it is that he uh, is doing that he wants to do with me, he's going to have to compete mm-hmm. um, and, you know, teaching him um, how to compete and, and how to win and how to lose. Um, I think is kind of where it starts. And then, you know, at a certain point, once they get past that, they've got to learn um, that there are going to be times that maybe they're not the most talented, they're not the the fastest or the strongest or the tallest or whatever it is, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a place for them. Right. Um, I think that would probably be the next step for my kids is, is teaching them that side of things. And, you know, once, he's a little bit older and maybe he's like in that junior high somewhere around that stage. It's more of um, encouraging him that sport can be, you know, a a vehicle to get where he wants to go. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe you want to be a lawyer or maybe you want to be a doctor, whatever it is, but man, how nice would it be to not have four or five years of education sitting on your student loans and have someone pay you to go to their school and pay you to eat and pay you to go play a game that you love. And then at the end of the day, you can do whatever you want. Mm. Right. And I think that that in itself, I think is something that um, will be an important lesson that he'll have to learn. And I think, you know, my daughters as well, that um, it is a vehicle to get to where you want to be. It just makes things a little bit easier. What do you think are the life skills that you learn from sport regardless if you you know end up going to a professional level or not Mm -hmm. you know having the foundation to play sport as a kid how do you think that prepares you for life jace well i think we're going deep here hey to wrap wrap up (laughs) this is we're going deep um it's it's that i think it's a concept of uh it doesn't matter who's watching you know you're watching yourself Right. And, and understand that, you know, the work that you put in when people aren't there is what matters more than when someone's watching you. Right. Mm -hmm. That taught me a lot about, you know, just doing the hard work and the, and, you know, not quitting and, oh, you know what, I'm good today. I'm just going to stay home and and maybe I'll just do it tomorrow. Instead, there's never that aspect to it. It's like, oh, where can I fit it in? Mm -hmm. Uh, If I can't, where can I make it up? Right. So, um, I can't remember the, the, there used to be this big plaque that said something along those lines of um, what you do in in front of people versus what you do at home or what have you. Um, I think that has to be number one for me in terms of the work that you put in when no one's watching. Yeah. That's the work that counts. Mm -hmm. Love it, man. Well, like I said, uh, I have an immense amount of respect for you. Not only what you have accomplished on the field, uh, and the adversity you've overcome, but as a as a father, as a husband, the role model you are, the incredible successful career you've had after sport, and the ambassador you continue to be. So I appreciate uh, your time this morning and and jumping on, having a chat with us, sharing some of your wisdom and insight into your journey, man. Hopefully, we inspire uh, the next generation of up and comers, and um, not necessarily your kids, Britt. Don't don't freak out. We'll we'll see. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Mm-hmm. but yeah man just uh, really appreciate you i appreciate it man thanks for the time we'll jump off here uh live and then 